Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Now, today I'm really excited to be speaking with Dr. Marina Harris and Shamima Youssef. Welcome both to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Nice to be here, Dan. Really excited to be speaking with you both. Um, We're going to be talking today about the Olympics, about Simone Biles, about mental health. We're going to have a really rich conversation today. Um, We're going to be talking about a a fantastic article, Marina, that you've written uh, for Psychology Today. But to get us started, as we always do, why don't we get you introducing yourselves to the Sports Psych Show audience? Uh, Marina, why why don't you go first? Yeah, sure. I'm Marina. I'm super excited to be here on the Sports Psych Show been involved with the sports psychology community now for um, probably 10 or 11 years. And I'm a psychologist with expertise in sport, eating disorders, and trauma. And you have, am I right in thinking you have a background in gymnastics? Is that, is that true? And is that at a sort of a kind of a competitive level? Yes. So I actually got a full scholarship to do gymnastics in college, uh, but then had a career ending injury. So didn't end up competing, but was lucky enough to be a coach. And then I got my bachelor's degree in sports psychology and then have just been in the sport world ever since. And I also specialize with aesthetic sport athletes and performers. So I work a lot with gymnasts, dancers, circus artists, uh, those types of things. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Circus artists. Fantastic. Uh, we'll have yeah. to have a little conversation about that today as well. Yeah. And, and Shamima, Shamima Yusuf, t- tell us a little bit about, about yourself. You've been on the Sports Site Show before. Why don't you reintroduce yourself, I suppose, to the, to the audience? Sure. Thanks, Dan. Uh, good to be here again, as I said. Um, so, uh, sports psychologist, and likewise, uh, been around in the field now for about 10, 11 years, um, with a transnational sort of career and background, uh, having started out in the States, and um, now, obviously, home is, is London, but um, I consider myself as having two homes. The other one is Zimbabwe, where I also... Um, do quite a bit of work uh, as a sports psychologist and I am also a mental health counsellor, a clinical mental health counsellor and so um, I tend to work uh, across the spectrum of performance and well-being and mental health. Well that's really what we're going to be speaking to today Um, and before we get on to this main topic of conversation I suppose perhaps on a maybe a slightly lighter note um, I mean we're going to be talking Olympics and the Olympics uh, as we're recording right now it finished a few days ago the closing ceremony was a couple of days ago so let's start with our should we start with our best memories our best moments of the Olympic Games Um, Dr Marina Harris what what did you what what did you love in this Olympic Games what were your favorite moments Oh, wow. That is... <laughs> that's, that's the toughest, <laughs> toughest question, question of the day. <laughs> no, I mean, my default is always <laughs> gymnastics because I wait four years for this. And so, of course, I think probably some of the highlights are gymnastics highlights. I mean, it was so amazing to see Suni Lee take the all-around championship uh, gold medal, especially as, you know... Um, a uh, Hmong person, I think is fabulous. And just to have more diversity in the sport, uh, because that's not something that I grew up with. And so I think that's phenomenal. And then of course, I love track and swimming and beach volleyball. So I was very closely following the United States <laughs> in regards to those sports. Oh, and Tom Daly winning the gold medal was also super cool. Super cool. 
and his knitting. Did you see that at all? He sits by the side of the pool and knits. I know, I love it. Like, what a great coping strategy (laughs) during a very, I'm sure, pressure-filled competition. Yeah, absolutely. And Shamima, what about yourself? Did you enjoy the Olympics? And what really stood out for you? Yeah, you know, funny you talk about Tom Daly because um, a lot of people probably don't know this or don't know enough about it, but the team behind him are Zimbabwean. Oh, wow. Uh, his his uh, the head coach, Jane, is, mm. is Zimbabwean and um, uh, Gareth uh, Ziambi is the uh, physio and, and the guy that keeps them all physically fit. Um, so it, it was kind of a special moment, especially for me, given that I, I, I know both of them um, and sort yeah. of I've been putting in my order for one of those cardigans with a Zimbabwean flag added on it, you know. <laughs> uh, and so I, I kind of said to Gareth that you you got to get them to knit knit one with a Zimbabwean uh, flag on it too. So um, yeah, if, you know, watching him get the gold super set special. Um, but I guess there's so many moments to speak speak about Dan but one of my one of my special two of my special moments and favorites were seeing the two high jumpers the uh, Qatari and the Italian um both sort of celebrate together a gold uh, that moment where they sort of say well is a gold possible for both of us can we can we share you know that position and they they kind of jump in the air with joy and I think that's uh, was a very special moment to see. Mm-hmm. And then I think uh, the other one for me, interestingly enough, had nothing to do with medals necessarily. It was Helen Glover returning home and uh, walking through the airport. Her three little kiddos come running towards her, three little babies you know, running towards her. And for me... Uh, I just thought that that kind of sums up what's really important in mm-hmm. sport, you know, or, and in life, not just in sport, just in life in general, what really matters. Yeah. I think I think that's so well said. I mean, I, I think let me start by saying I'll, I'll slightly contribute here and say, um, actually, fun, funnily enough, Marina, I, I was thinking about this earlier and I, actually I was going to go straight towards the gymnastics and I was going to say the, the performance of Max Whitlock. Uh, was just absolutely. Mm. I mean, if we're just talking pure performance, it was just incredible. Just yeah. watching him and just not that I don't do this all the time as a sports psychologist, because my perception is probably hopelessly biased towards considering the internal sensations and feelings and emotions and thoughts that are trying to, uh, I suppose, sabotage uh, performances at times, and just considering just the momentum he kept on that pommel horse. I mean, again, I'm I'm, I'm not anywhere near as well acquainted with with the sport as you are marina but I, I that was such a highlight for me from a performance perspective i think and obviously tom's as well to mm-hmm. echo what you've both said tom daly absolutely incredible um uh, i mean his his career um and and the personality he brings uh, to the sport anyway has been brilliant over the last decade mm-hmm. perhaps even decade and a half i can't remember now but um uh, to see him win gold uh, it, it, it is fantastic. Uh, I think, um, again, as a sports psychologist, hopefully biased, but um, to listen to the BBC reporter interview, uh, I think the four-man relay, um, the swimming relay, and I th- they may have won silver, but uh, the reporter asked Adam PT, um, what's different? You know, British swimming has, whether you call it underperformed or nearly performed for the you know for a number of years what's different this year and he he sort of gave a a cheeky smile to the reporter and said belief belief that's the difference now I don't think performance in sport is underpinned unidimensionally so I'm sure there's the the landscape is slightly more complex than that right and I wrote a little article on that uh, a few days ago that that I love Mm -hmm. it but I'm not too sure if it's entirely true but to have a, a, a sportsman of, of Adam Peaty's stature, leadership, eloquence, talk about the mental side of the game I, is just wonderful to hear. And, and I, I do wonder, and I, I want to fire another question at you both. I mean, Shams, you talked about Helen Glover and that video from the airport and 
welcome or, or being welcomed back home by her three kids and you know we'll, we'll move on to the article which was about mental health and well-being and there seemed to be this time around so much more of a narrative around whether it's performance psychology well-being mental health we almost feel like we're either we're kind of on the precipice of a bit of a paradigm shift that the world is starting to pay attention to the brain, the nervous system, and and rather than just the exterior and rather than just the medals. Again, I don't want to preempt what we're going to come on and talk about, but did you, did Marina, did you get that feeling? There was there more of a narrative around that stuff in America uh, uh, like there was in Britain? Absolutely. And Even just the way that the Olympics was announced and framed was so much more mental health and well-being driven than we've seen in the past, especially when you compare it to, you know, to give another gymnastics reference, the 96 Olympics when like Carrie Strug, you know, pushed through everything and injured herself on the vault in order to win the gold medal you know, the narrative was so different compared to that, which I, as a mental health professional, adore. <laughs> so. And, and Shams, what's your thoughts on that? Do you feel that we're on a, a, the precipice of a bit of a paradigm shift potentially? I, I definitely think so, Dan. You know, a decade ago, I, I always sort of say this, it, it makes me chuckle, actually. A decade ago on return from the US, well, not quite a decade ago, but uh, close enough, I um, I was speaking about well-being and mental health, and uh, my philosophy has always been performance well-being. And I was meeting with a lot of sport organizations and and individuals in sport, and they sort of said to me, "Well, that's not that's not sports psychology," uh, you know. And I was like, "Well, yes, it is," you know. Um, and so it's interesting to see that even in our field, we've made that shift. Um, and I think in wider society, I think people are beginning to recognise the importance of well-being and mental health, um, and not mm-hmm. so focused on the outcomes of performance. Yeah. Or, or at least not, I mean, let's put it this way. The outcomes uh, are important, but it's mm-hmm. not where mm-hmm. the attention is focused. I feel like that parallels also the shift in our field. You know, I don't know if y'all have felt this as well, but I felt like there's so much of a bigger shift not only in the mental health community, but also in the sports psychology community towards talking about values and the type of life you want to live and the type of athlete you want to be rather than how do we just get your optimal performance. And that's the work that I feel like is so much more rich and fulfilling. And Shams, just like you said, showing us what life is really about. You know, it is not helpful to put all our eggs in one basket in sport. It is so helpful to have a well-rounded life and view sport as an extension of our life and who we want to be and the legacy that we want to leave as a way of being instead of a way of doing or getting certain outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and there's such a strong link between the performance piece and well-being and mental health and and just as a, 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 a I suppose almost like a useful introduction to, to the piece that you've written on psychology today Marina I mean I, I'd, I'd be fascinated to hear as, uh, as long as you're, you're, you're comfortable with this uh, hear your experience as an elite level gymnast uh, and and you can speak to as I say, your experience or your um, your experience of performance psychology or mental mm-hmm. health at that time and the, the offerings that there were. Um, tell us a bit about your experiences as, as a gymnast. Yeah, sure. I haven't talked about this in so long. So this is just such a kind of privilege to be able to chat about. Um, so I, you know, was a gymnast from the time I was five. It was the only thing that I did, you know, even as a, I think, elementary school child or in England is that primary school? (laughs) Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
you know, that was all I did. And I was already practicing 20 to 25 hours a week at that point. You know, you're really on the fast track towards the elite level. And I was never considered elite. I always knew that college was my goal and I was not at the caliber of the athletes who are in the Olympics now. But I felt so much pressure. Uh, You know, there is so much that is put into this sport, I think more so than other sports. And gymnasts are really indoctrinated into these systems that make it very easy for abuse to happen, I think. Because, you know, you're training 24-7 with certain coaches. You are asked to put all your life on the back burner for gymnastics in order to prioritize gymnastics. And I had great experience as a gymnast, but I also had some really troubling experiences as a gymnast. And through my work as a mental health professional, have worked on my own journey of healing from that and want other gymnasts and other athletes to know that they can do that too. You know, that the get tough put everything aside, push yourself to your actual breaking point is not the only way to do sport. And that's really been my mission just in working with both athletes and to be frank with you, people in general. I think we all need more of that. 20 to 25 hours a week, Marina, when did that, what age did that start? (sighs) That's a good question. Um, I, I uh, Sorry, I must have misspoke. Probably in elementary school, I would say it may, may have been 15 to 18 hours. Okay. And then in middle school. Which is still a lot. Yeah, right? still a lot. And then probably in middle school, <laughs> I remember my mom saying that they wanted to move me up and do 20 hours a week. And her being like, she's 12 or <laughs> something. And how outrageous that seemed. But, you know, the parents are like, oh, I guess if she wants to do this sport, this is what she has to do. And there's a lot of that in gymnastics. Oh, if if they want to get to the Olympics, this is what we have to do to get there. Well, I was going to ask, I mean, is there some kind of rule or law that suggests that children have to do that amount of gymnastics? Is it an absolute critical essential that they do that to get to the Olympics? Honestly, I don't know. I don't think anybody has ever challenged this idea. Yeah. But I will say that the Olympic athletes that you're seeing have been slated for the Olympics at a very young age. You know, they go to a certain gym, they go to certain coaches, they know they're on that track from a very, very young age. And I don't know the answer if that if it needs to be that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the article you've written, which is entitled Simone Biles and Team USA Redefine Mental Toughness, the true definition of mental grit and what we can learn from it. I suppose seeing the the plight of Simone Biles made you put pen to paper, Marina? You just felt that you had to write something about this? Yeah, it felt like a tipping point for me. I haven't been super involved in gymnastics since I left college because I needed some distance for my own healing. And as I've been in this field, obviously been working with gymnasts, of course, in a sports psychology capacity. But among recent events... You know, especially with the Nasser assaults, the emotional and verbal abuse that occurred and has occurred over years and the leadership that has allowed that to happen. I felt like this article had been sort of brewing inside of me for a really long time. And then watching Simone do this was the tipping point where I was like, I get this. I understand the system that she's in. And I of course, can never understand her lived experience because of a lot of different factors, because nobody can understand Simone Biles' experience except for Simone Biles. But I wanted, I saw a lot of the news coverage of it, and I didn't think that it gave adequate 
representation to the systems that gymnasts grow up in, as well as the cultural factors that are in play. And I really wanted to give voice to that. And before we go into the specific details around what we saw with regard to Simone Biles, um, Shamima, how, how, how did you get involved with this article? How did you both start working together on this? Uh, Marina just wanted someone to, she had already written the piece and was just yeah. hoping that someone could uh, look it over and, and sort of help frame the, some of the cultural piece there, although I think she she did a pretty good job on her own. Um, but just to sort of add to that a little bit, um, so I sort of mm-hmm. suggested that I'd be happy to, to support that. Thank you for doing that. I think it enhanced the article so much. I'm just so grateful, you know, that this was something that we were able to have a, you know, sort of team effort on because I, I think it was really important for me to to have a lot of different eyes on the paper before I sent it out so that I was doing justice to the people I was talking about. It's a really rich piece. And, and to do it justice today, let, let's begin at the beginning. So the Olympic gymnastics, the, the, the event started. What did you, I'm sure people listening in know what happened, but in your world, Marina, what did you see? What did you experience? What were you watching? What happened with Simone Biles? That's a great question. Honestly, at first I felt confused, like most people did and I wanted to know what happened. Mm -hmm. And then I saw her interview saying that, you know, she was prioritizing her well-being. And I just thought, well, we all have to support this. You know, this is something we've been talking about for a long time and how gymnasts are expected to put their well-being at the back burner continuously in order to perform. And to me, it was a message loud and clear, like this can no longer continue. This is not sustainable anymore. So what you saw was Biles not completing or completing a different vault. She did a one and a half twist instead of two and a half twist. And yes, then there was a kind of a news conference and she she announced that she was going to pull back from the events for the sake of her mental health. And that left you a little bit, con- or at least watching mm-hmm. her do the one and a half twists rather than the two and a half, two and a half, you were confused. And then when she delivered uh, in a news conference, and she talked about protecting her mental health. It there was a bit of a light bulb moment for you. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, just witnessing it, gymnasts do get lost in the air a lot of the time. Okay. You know, I've had those moments and it's not, it's not a lot of the time, but I've definitely had at least, you know, 10 or 20, 30 times in my career where I've been doing something and just thinking, oh, gee, I don't know where I'm going to land. Like, oh, no, hopefully this ends up okay. And that is the scariest moment. It it truly cannot be put into words how terrifying it is to be falling, knowing that you're going to land on something, but you don't know what it is you're going to land on. And so it's not something that's completely uncommon, but the fact is that it's really dangerous when it happens. And so you saw Simone Biles just sort of like open up her arm in the twist and could tell that she really just didn't know where she was. And that's terrifying and it's dangerous. And the fact that she said, I can't do continue to do this safely, I think is a really loud and clear message. It must be terrifying. Uh, 
when I played pro golf, I didn't know where the golf club was in my golf swing half the time. But that's not very dangerous. It just means I hit a bad golf shot, which uh, was slightly frustrating at times, Marina and Shams, I can assure you, but uh, certainly not dangerous. Um, and I suppose for the public watching in, there, and, and the vast majority of people, thankfully, I'm sure had a great deal of empathy um, for what Simone Biles was going through um, the experiences she was having and the decision that, that she made. Obviously, there were a few dissenting voices, sadly. Um, but there's, you're, you're, you're speaking there about the twisties, this term, the twisties. And obviously, in, in, in golf, there's a term yips, and in, in darts, there's a term dart, dartitis, I, I believe. Um, ha- had you heard of any link between mental health and experiencing twisties at all or, or had you experienced it in your own career or experienced it you know from 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 somebody else other than Simone I when I was a gymnast I never heard of the name twisties but I knew what she was yeah. talking about you know there are times in yeah. gymnastics where I have felt I sort of lost a skill like could perform a skill previously somehow it got mixed up in my head and couldn't figure out how to do it anymore. And so it didn't quite have a name when I was coming up. But I think when we're talking about health and safety, you know, it sounds like the twisties for Simone was more about health and safety and making sure that she could do gymnastics safely. But when we're talking about that, we have to talk about mental health because mental health is health and it is safety. And I think that's really important. And I don't think that we can ignore the backdrop that has followed USA Gymnastics for the past, I don't know, 25 years. And so that's where I view mental health coming into play. Any thoughts on that yourself, Shams? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Marina has given some pretty good insight on that. I think the other context is, of course, the year that we've had, Um, you know, a pandemic year. And, of course, there's the other cultural background and backdrop that we need to consider. Simone Biles is a black female athlete um, who, being an American, um, and and of course we know the sort of violence um, and the racialized events that were experienced by everyone around the world, actually, but of course... um, sort of mm. hits home in, a, in America more so because it's, you know, the context of living in America. Um, and I think every black person that I have spoken to uh, was affected um, by, by what was seen. And not just every black person, I mean, you know, any person who who actually was subjected to watching what unfolded in in America was affected by it. Most were. Um, And it's not just one event, though, right? For for those who have been marginalized in society, um, that sort of racism is, is trauma when you are constantly having to relive those experiences. Uh, and whilst you, you do get on with things, I mean, I, you know, I, I had someone sort of say, well, don't they just get on with things? Don't, don't you just get on with it? Well, absolutely, people do kind of go on and, and live, but that doesn't mean to say they don't live with that pain um, and that trauma that, that they still have. You know, mm-hmm. the scars are there, actually, Dan. Um, and you might sort of say, well, in the context of her performance, well, how does that come into play? And, and, and you know, 
how is that so important in the moment of performance? Um, if you are uh, sort of experiencing something, which we later come to know that, you know, uh, she had um, learnt of her aunt passing away a couple of days before her event, I believe. I think that's what she hmm. um, shared with the media. If you are going through some sort of grief, some sort of um, concern, you know, before an event, yep. you're, you're already having had a year that she ha had had, you, you're already reminded of, of a lot of the backdrop or, 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 you know, the experiences that you've had this past year, the difficulties that you've been through in, in the year. And then added to that, you're reliving another traumatic event. Um, and so, of course, you know, in those moments, it's really mo more important to take care of yourself than to, to really try and push on um, and, and just get on with things. There are certain things, yes, you do go about doing and functioning, but there's a difference between functioning and thriving. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the point that I'm trying to get to is that, yes, we get on with things, we carry on functioning, but we're not necessarily thriving when we are, uh, you know, experiencing a lot of trauma in such a sort of short span of time. Marina, the audience wouldn't have seen you given give um, Shams a, a, a mini clap there. <laughs> what, were you, what were you clapping uh, her about? I just so appreciate everything that Shams shared, you know, with the cultural backdrop and the widespread impact of trauma and the fact that there is a difference between functioning and thriving. And also this idea that you don't have to, you know, if you feel that you need to take time away, you have the agency to do that. You know, athletes are human beings first. And when we moralize their choices as good or bad or right or wrong, we're taking away their agency and humanity. I just want to read something to, to you both. Um, about a, a week ago, there were a few messages on, on Twitter doing the rounds and uh, a colleague of ours, Dr. Chris Shambrook, who's been on the Sports Site show a, a couple of times, retweeted um, some empirical evidence and research evidence that backs up what you're both saying. Um, uh, it's from uh, actually a PhD study from a, a, a Dr. Jen Gandhi, who I believe works for the English FA Football Association here, and um, uh, she sh she showed a relationship basically between uh, lost move syndrome and, and anxiety. She, she says mm -hmm. that extensive triangulated findings provided in this thesis suggest that the yips, so she's talking about the yips, uh, the yips and lost move syndrome are psychological disorders, the basis of which is anxiety and that significant life events might lead to their development. So there's some research support there um, from a, a prominent uh, psychologist here in the UK who, who is supporting this notion of life events that cause anxiety can influence the experience of lost move syndrome the yips, diatitis, twisties, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, and to speak to what you both said, but what you at the beginning Ed, were, were detailing, Marina, that there are multiple, there are multiple things going on here in the background, whether it's the experience that Simone had with and other countless, hundreds of other gymnasts have had um, in the US with USA Gymnastics, uh, combined with the, the racial challenges that uh, Simone has experienced, combined with other familial challenges as well, it's it, when one puts that into context, it absolutely, I mean, it, 
it's incredible that Simone Biles hasn't pulled out of important events prior to this. I mean, it speaks to her, whether you call it dedication or commitment to her own mental health or commitment to however one wants to describe it, how she hasn't pulled out previously, I just don't know. No question there, Marina, but any thoughts, you, further thoughts you have? No, I think you said it all. You know, I think at the backdrop of this is just the importance of acknowledging how widespread trauma is and how when we work with athletes, we can't ascribe to the fallacy that performance exists in a vacuum. We have to know that athletes are human beings that are influenced by a variety of factors and understand the cultural backdrop of what's going on, as well as any prior experiences these athletes have had. Marina, you talk, there's a section in your article uh, entitled Competing Versus Healing that details, I suppose, the importance of giving competitive athletes, elite athletes, developing elite athletes, all athletes, the opportunity to to heal from traumatic experiences. But I, w- I would also suggest that just to experience rest and recuperation from their sport as well, to not have this overwhelming feeling of, I've got to high perform, I've got to high perform, I've got to high perform. Healing is important, isn't it? Whether it's just... Um, just simple rest and recuperation, but sometimes healing from traumatic experiences. Mm-hmm. Right. And I talk about how competing versus healing is not mutually exclusive. You know, you can do the work of healing while you're competing, but sometimes you can't. And sometimes rest and recuperation is necessary. And knowing that that is not the only way to heal, that athletes can't just rest a little bit and get over wide-reaching trauma. That is not how the human brain and body works. Unfortunately, if it did, we wouldn't need mental health professionals anymore. (laughs) But unfortunately, that's not how it works. And it takes so much more purposeful effort. Yeah, I'd I'd like to chime in there, actually, because what that reminds me of, um, and I'm not sure Marina would have seen this, but uh, Dan, I'm sure you've seen the documentary with Anton Ferdinand. Yes. Right? Um, And the trauma we speak to there is racial trauma, um, an incident where he was abused on, on the football pitch, and it's years and years later that he is still processing that whole experience and incident and even to his surprise when he meets up with the coach you know the, the coach at the time he was working with the manager at the time he was he was working with was um, you know shocked to hear that from the coach that his performance was never quite the same again after that incident. And so in that moment, he's left almost speechless because he's trying to now process that revelation. And so, you know, that speaks to what Marina sort of suggests is that you don't, trauma is a long process. It's not just something you get over, you know, or you deal with overnight, it takes time to heal. Um, and, and him doing that documentary, it sounds like was all part of his healing process. Does that mean that we need environments that offer prevention rather than cure? I know, Shams, that you're passionate about helping sporting organisations build healthy and safe environments for their participants have we got to get away from cure and more into prevention here so so i'll respond sure um i don't think it's about getting away from one uh, 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 but it's having a dual 
dual focus yes. in place. So, yep. uh, yes, prevention is is critical. It's it's so important to have in in a you know uh, prevention programs and support systems uh, or, or education systems in place. Um, and then absolutely the the intervention support um, program too alongside that. It's not one or the other, it's both that is required. And when we think about health, healthy and safe environments for participants, for competitors, if we come back to gymnastics and we come back to, I suppose, the notion of it's intense to compete, not just in gymnastics, but if we're focusing on just gymnastics, it's intense to compete in gymnastics. It's, you've got to learn, you've got to strive to learn these skills to do superhuman things. How do we, what do healthy and safe environments look like in gymnastics? And when we're under pressure as coaches, as, as participants, as sporting organizations to develop these superhuman skills how do we accommodate healthy and safe environments not small questions not big questions at all there marina by the way not at all (laughs) (laughs) yeah i firmly believe it's all about how you set up the environment you know we know that people can do these superhuman skills it's not about teaching them physically in a different way. It's about setting up environments where athletes feel cared for as people and feel important as people that they are not just machines to perform for as entertainment for the masses. You know, that is not a a helpful or safe environment. And the, you know, antithesis to that is Coach is not falling prey to the per- the pressure of stressing performance outcomes over human outcomes. And we know from research in sports psychology that when we stress the process, the outcomes happen. But we need to stress the process of compassion and caring for these athletes in a performance environment. You know, gone is the fallacy or belief that if we care for our athletes, they're going to be weak or they're going to be soft because that's not what happens. They're actually more mentally tough when we do that. You know, I love that, Marina, because actually what What we've seen here, and Dan, you will know this, what we've seen with the GB team returning is, you know, so many successes um, and their whole sort of narrative and um, philosophy has shifted towards well-being and caring for the athletes, people first, and yet they've still been hugely successful at this games, you know? So I think that's, um, that's evidence in itself. Really. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Shams. And I, I, you know, I, I reflect back on my episode on the sports site show with Elliot Newell, um, who Marina, uh, Elliot is a fantastic sports psychologist who works at, at the English Institute of Sport and, um, we we just really talked about the importance of psychologically informed environments and the importance of coaches and key stakeholders in organisations building the capacity to negotiate with participants, competitors, to co-create solutions mm-hmm. and to challenge and probe around the well-being and mental health piece. And 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 yes, to stretch and stretch in a in a healthy in a safe way, but also support. And sometimes it requires us to intervene from a, well, we actually think we need to explore stepping back a little bit here and having a bit more rest and recuperation and and altering your program a little bit because at the moment, not only are you not getting the outcomes, but we feel that there's some 
well-being challenges here mm-hmm. that you might be ex- might be experiencing. So, uh, th- th- I think there's an interesting dynamic whereby, in our profession, profession because we know we, we we've perhaps read, seen research, and we know that performance is nuanced and learning and development is nuanced. Actually, it's incumbent on us to help the athletes themselves understand that perhaps they don't have to do 25 hours a week to, to win a gold medal. Maybe they just do 15 quality hours per week, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Again, no question, but if you either of you have any thoughts on that? Uh, in, no, uh, you know, I, I don't really have too much to add to that, actually, Dan, I, I think. You'd agree. <laughs> what, I, what, what comes to mind, I mean, what, what really comes to mind is, in a sense, what we're doing is we're empowering athletes to be able to say, mm-hmm. actually, this is too much for me, or you know, I need to, I need to step out of here, um, and not, not necessarily come down on them for for doing so, yeah. um, but you know, trusting in them and recognizing that they know their bodies better than anyone. Yeah. In fact, we know our ourselves better than anyone. So why? would we necessarily rely on someone else to tell us when actually we've reached our threshold? Um, and so it, part of that is, is one, you know, you spoke about this prevention and intervention. It, it's about educating um, our athletes on how they become uh, more in tune with what their limits are. Yes. Um, but also the coaches, the managers, the staff around them, uh, sort of helping them to recognize how to hold those conversations with the athletes themselves uh, and empower the athletes to have agency in, in their mental health and well being. Well said. Mental toughness. But surely, come on, everyone's got to be tough. That's the only way you win a gold medal. (laughs) Um, I think you closed the piece, Marina, on this mental toughness piece and and, and considering what that is and what that isn't. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, certainly I'm not an expert on mental toughness toughness, although I am a sports psychologist, so I obviously speak on this quite a bit, but I think there's a big misconception. You know, mental toughness is about performing at the upper limits of your capabilities more often, but I write in the article, you know, it is not consistently pushing past those limits. You are stretching, but you're not breaking And too often we're encouraging athletes to go so far past their limits that they're breaking instead of only stretching them. And I really think that instead of talking about mental toughness, we should shift to talking more about mental poise because I think it gives so much more permission to understand and know limits. And just like Sham said earlier, training athletes to know their limits and empowering them to determine for themselves when it is too much and when it is not. Because the fact is that coaches and spectators are not actually out there doing the sport. And so you can talk all you want, but you are not the one who actually has to go out and do it. I love that term mental poise. Um, I certainly wish I'd displayed that on the first tee. I don't know if mental poise would be a good description for where I was at. Tell tell me, Marina, about mental poise. So I didn't uh, coin the term myself. It I I don't think they call it mental poise, but they call it poise. Okay. Is uh, authors Gardner and Moore in their mindfulness acceptance and commitment protocol. And they talk about mental poise being performance in the service of your goals and values, which is 
the principles that somebody holds. So just like earlier when we were talking about the kind of person and the kind of athlete you want to be, that is mental poise and thinking about the process and the service of outcomes rather than thinking of outcomes over everything. This has got Shams's signature all over this, mental poise and acceptance and commitment. Uh, I mean, we, we, we spent a good hour talking about a lot of this in our in, in the episode that we shared um, oh, about 18 months ago, Shams. But um, mm. that's such a great term, mental poise. I, I really love it. That's something that you're striving to help participants engage in um, as they're competing. Would I be correct in saying that? Yes, I, I think when we can connect back to what truly matters, and that's the values piece, right? When you can connect back to what truly matters for you and and connect that to, to you know, a, a, and in service of your daily actions that can lead you to outcomes and, and your goals, Um I think when you can do that, um, you're more more focused on who you are or or simply rather being rather than needing to um, be something that someone else perceives. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that makes sense. more. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. It almost has more of an authentic feel to it. Shams, an authentic competitor or so, authentic participant. Yeah, that that's exactly the word to use. Actually, uh, Dan, authenticity is is so important. And Marina, you close this piece with a heading saying mental poise, mental health, front and center, mental poise, mental health, front and center, which feels like it covers off both the performance and the, the everyday lived experience of participants, of competitors. Um, Are you optimistic? (laughs) Do you feel that, I mean, obviously, we opened the show suggesting that we might be on the verge of a paradigm shift, but I'm assuming the landscape in gymnastics and possibly other sports as well, but in gymnastics, there's a lot of work to be done before mm-hmm. we, we see mental poise and mental health being put front and center. Yes. Whenever I answer this question, I always, almost always take a dialectical stance, which is that we're doing the best we can. And there's always more that we could be doing. And I think it's only then, it's only when we accept where we're at that we can change. And I think it's only that we understand where we are at in these conversations to know where we can do better. And the fact is, uh, it's taking a growth mindset, you know, that we can always improve this for our athletes, even if it's wonderful, which obviously right now it's not. <laughs> but even if it's, you know, at the upper levels of, of its performance, we can always improve it more. Well, look, I think that's so well said, Marina. Shams, did you have uh, anything to say on that? Yeah, I, I, I love what Marina had to say there. And I think even though we strive to do better in support and provide the systems around the athletes, um, we still need to acknowledge and recognize that in life as individuals, we will all have mental health challenges. It doesn't mean because we've got better systems in place that those athletes may not experience these challenges as, you know, through their career. But the difference is we have empowered them to have agency in um, saying how, how they want to deal with it um, and uh, when they need time to heal and recover. Um, and the people around them, the, the staff and coaches and the teams around them are also better equipped to manage 
those conversations and to support in those circumstances. What I'm hearing you say is it's simply providing an environment and perhaps coaching practices and processes and underpinning philosophies that give give participants a better opportunity to experience both mental health and mental yeah. poise. Yeah. Great. Well, well said, Shams. Yeah, very well said, Shams. Well, look, that's. A, I think that's a. That's. A, I don't know whether to go on for another hour or or call it a day there, but I'll respect both of your times because I just think that was so well said at the end there, Shams. In terms of, you know, this notion of nobody's offering necessarily a, a, a magic bullet here, a, a, some magic dust. There's no absolute solution here to mental health, but we have to consider the kind of environment and practices that we, we engage athletes in to to help them manage, you know, their day to day well being and mental health. And and so so respecting both of your times, um, we we will close the show. But um, look, fantastic conversation and I, I thank you both so much. And I and I urge people to, to go online and on psychology today and read Marina's piece, which was ably put together uh, in conjunction with with Shams's guidance as well. So, um, look just just to, to just to to finish the show, Marina. I, I know you would have tapped the interest of the sports site show audience. Um, where can people find you, your work, are you on social media? Where can they read this article? Give us the the, the rundown. So, I'm probably most active on Twitter. Mm-hmm. My Twitter handle is Dr. Marina Harris. Mm-hmm. And my website, which is drmarinaharris.com to make it easy on everyone. And I have all my writing in one location, things about me. And I'm happy for anyone to reach out on Twitter to continue the conversation. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And Shams. Um, how can how can people find you? Are you on social media? How can how can you be found if you want to be found? Uh, oh yeah, I, I guess social media. Uh, we're talking about Twitter. Um, yep. I'm I'm on there. I think it's Empower to Perform, which is my company name. The word Empower, and then the digit two, and then Perform. Um, LinkedIn as Shamima Yusuf. Um, so yeah, that's probably the best. I do have my website, which is also um, empoweredtoperform.com. Yep. Um, probably not as active as there as I should be, but um, there you go. What, people, what people, I, people can reach out to you there. Yes, they can. Yeah. Um, what, what I'd like to also say um, before we finish off here, um, Dan, is that uh, Marina did a great job of writing this in the psychology today. But it was also um, written up in the medium, wasn't it, uh, Marina? Yes, that's true. Thanks for mentioning that. So um, if you can't okay. find it on Psychology Today, you'll find it on the medium. Perfect. Brilliant. Okay, well, look, thank you both so much for coming on the show. It's been a really interesting hour, and uh, I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Well, everybody, I really enjoyed that podcast, uh, and I hope you did too. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback. So if you do have any suggestions for us, please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the show. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.